All right, welcome back. We are in week four and exploring today chapters three and four. Um, popular photography and the aims of art is where we'll start today. So as uh, photography is going through these early stages of development, everyone's talking about it, right? In journals, magazines, newspapers, uh, enthusiasts are forming clubs and forums where they can come together and discuss all of the things that they want to talk about regarding this new phenomenon, photography. And one topic that keeps coming up is the truthfulness of the photograph. There is an 1860s issue of Art Journal that stated the following quote, the photograph cannot deceive, in nothing can it extenuate. There is no power in this marvelous machine either to add or to take from what we know, what we see is true. And this notion of truthfulness is a theme that's going to run throughout our discussion here and throughout um, our conversation about photography for the rest of, of the, the term here. Many photographers had their differences with what they thought photography should be used for. And there were many debates over how to make room for more imaginative, artistic camera work while maintaining this respect for its more utilitarian uses, documentation, um, archives, record keeping, etc. So there's this man, his name is C. Jabez Hughes, and he suggested that photography be divided into three classes. Now, before I dive into these three classes, um, it should be noted that this, is, this was an experiment, right? This was a thought that he had to try to figure out how to use photography, how to make rules for photography. These three categories that he's come up with are not hard and fast, and they never were, but this was just something that, you know, one of many, many attempts to try to organize how photography should be used at this time. So first, we have mechanical photography. And Mechanical photography is basically just intended to be a very precise, exact depiction, very literal, um, of what you see. And you can see this, this example here, shells and fossils, it's a daguerreotype by Daguerre. Um, it's, it's just Daguerre documenting his collection of, of shells and fossils. There's uh, not much more to it, right? It makes a lovely image, but it is only intended to show you that these are his shells and his fossils, and it's an archive of them. The second category is what Hughes called art photography. So this is where the photographer would arrange the photograph um, to, to appear more beautiful or aesthetically pleasing than if he had just documented the raw scene as he had found it. And here we can see uh, Hippolyte Bayard again. He's arranged uh, uh, and set up a self-portrait. He's taken artistic agency with the space and the arrangement of the props so as to elevate the resulting photograph from just a portrait to something more. Now, it seems as though there's some overlap between mechanical and art photography, right? For the purpose of this, this discussion and outlining what Hughes is up to here, we're going to stick to the, the three categories. Um, however, you can sort of see that Daguerre would have had to make a choice on how to set up his shells and fossils, how to frame them, how far away to stand with the camera. Those things are agency. So even with mechanical photography, you're going to have some artistic agency going into that. So that's sort of where we see this overlap here. Um, Bayard doing his you know, classic self-portraits again. He's clearly set up all of these props. Um, these, he calls them plaster casts, but these little statuettes that he has. And, and he's, he's telling a little bit more of a, a story here. It's a, a higher level portrait than just a mechanical photograph. Finally, we have the third category. This one's called high art. And 
I like to, before I dive into this, share the quote directly from Hughes, which he says, certain pictures which aim at higher purposes than the majority of art photographs and whose aim is not merely to amuse, but to instruct, purify, and ennoble. Now, instruct, purify, and ennoble, what the heck does that mean? Um, high art photography is intended to tell a story, have a message behind it, more so than an art photograph. And this one here, um, which we'll, we'll talk more in depth about the specific image later, but at first glance you can see how different this one is from the other two. There's a lot more going on. It almost looks like a painting. And so when something like a photograph like this looks like a painting, you can tell they're trying to elevate it to that same level of painting. And so what they would be doing with these higher photographs is essentially illustrating um, stor stories that have a moral um, or ethical clause to them, uh, some sort of religious undertones, mythological undertones, perhaps they're illustrating something from literature, um, bringing it to a higher level. So as I said, it would have been kind of tricky to just stick to these three categorizations as there obviously is going to be overlap between them as well as expansion beyond them. So um, these, this was just sort of Hugh's start, starting point. Obviously, since we don't use these categories any longer today, um, they didn't really stick or work too well. But they were important for that time, and they're important for understanding how we sort of move through the history of photography. So as I said, we'll come back specifically to this Two Ways of Life by Oscar Raylander um, down the road here in a bit. But um, let's move on to talking a little bit more about the stereograph. So we talked about the stereograph last week, but I wanted to share a little bit more about it, go a little bit more in depth. Um, it was a really important movement within photography at this time. And so because the stereograph was so low priced, it was part of this driving force that turned photography into an industry. And what it did was it made viewers want to see more of the world. Once they got a taste of this stereograph and all the different far off places that they could view in 3D in their homes, they were super excited about it. Um, as we talked about last week, the original stereographs were taken with two cameras set right next to each other. So as to take an image as if they were corresponding to our human binocular vision. And very quickly, we, um, got new stereo cameras that were invented that already had the two lenses built in and they would produce the two images at the same time, similarly to how if you set up two cameras next to each other. So um, this just made it easier um, and more portable for people to, to take their own stereos. They, did, they didn't have to um, lug around two giant cameras any longer. And so with these new cameras, <clears throat> it became very easy and quick to make these stereographic images and photographers and amateurs began mass producing and distributing these images like crazy. And they became so popular that some of the publishing houses could have up to 50,000 different subjects that they could market and sell to the public. So um, here's, a, here's like a, a nice fancy stereo camera. You can see it's got an interchangeable lens plate. There's the, the stereo lens that's mounted on the camera as you see it here. And then leaning up against the box next to it is the single lens. So this would have been a very fancy version of a camera that allowed you to alternate between taking stereos and singular images. And those two boxes in the front, those are the um, plate holders. So that's where you would have put your sensitized paper or plates inside, and then you insert that into the camera one by one to take your images. Um, so <clears throat> what I mean by having 50,000 different subjects, that doesn't mean just like 50,000 different cards. That's sets of cards, and most of the stereo cards um, would come in sets of, you know, 10 to 20 different um, scenes that you can kind of work your way through. So um, that's a massive amount of, of product to have on hand to be selling. And, you know, to us, these um, stereographs might seem kind of dull, sort of stale, just everyday images of places and people and things, but 
back then these were 3D images that like truly, truly captured um, the world in a way that people couldn't see it. Because if you recall, not everyone can, can travel, right? Very few people have the ability to travel at this time. So um, this would have been a way for you to be able to purchase at a very reasonable rate um, a window into the, the vast world beyond what you experience firsthand. Now, before we continue, let's go back here. Um, so I have a link to an article by Oliver Wendell Holmes from the June 1859 issue of The Atlantic. And let me pull that up for you. We won't read it here, but it, we will. Um, I'll have it in the Blackboard course materials in the read section um, or the watch section, whatever ends up working um, here. So here he writes about the sort of celebrity of stereography and how it was seen as a way to escape into a dream world and experience one strange scene after another. Can you imagine being, you know, rural Wisconsin in the 19th century and you're able to go and buy a set of stereos from Egypt or um, South America or even something closer to home, Grand Canyon? something like that. You've never experienced anything remotely like this in your entire life. And this just becomes, you know, a crazy phenomenon that everyone is super excited about. So um, here, I will let you read this on your own time. But this is the article from that 1859 issue of the Atlantic. Okay, so let's go back to our slides here. There we go. Um, so Oliver Wendell Holmes thought the stereograph surpassed painting in its very intense illusionism, the 3D effect. That's the illusion that he's talking about. And its potential to broadcast knowledge to a much wider audience than anything ever could before. Um, there were many critics of the, the stereograph that questioned if, if there would be a need for anyone to travel in the future now that you could just send the photographers and the artists out into the world and they would capture it and they would bring it back to you um, in the form of a stereograph for in-home viewing. Now, obviously, that's a little far-fetched, but at that time when it was incredibly expensive and difficult to travel, the stereograph was a way to provide information and entertainment that could educate the masses. So stereographs were marketed in a way that made consumers want to collect them all. Um, I don't know what folks collect today. When I was younger, it was um, pogs and um, so, some folks did the, the trading cards, baseball cards. Um, there, there was the Beanie Baby craze. I think now I've heard folks collecting those like little um, character dolls. I can't recall what they're called, but anyways, um, this was this was an early version of that. It was a craze, and you know everyone wanted to collect them. Images of travel, religion, urban scenes, architecture. Um, some of these series were set up as if they're stories or performed scenes. <clears throat> uh, so you might get a set that is you know a story from from the Bible or another religious text, you might get a set that's um, a Shakespearean play being acted out that you can sort of follow along through these series of stereos. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned at the end of last week, there was also the very um, successful, desired, and sought after pornographic stereos. And the lightness of this camera made it really easy to travel with. So photographers would often take their stereo cameras with them, even when they weren't intending on making stereographic images, because you could just use one frame from the stereo set as your image. You did not have to pair them together as a stereograph here. OK, next. So the next. Uh, item we're going to talk about is the carte de visite. And that means card photograph. It was a it was a, another popular and, and successful version of these early photographic experiments. So the carte de visite was 
a small photograph intended to be sort of pasted on the back of a what they called in the days a visiting card but today we call it a business card um, so they're about four inches by two and a half inches in size and you would put your photograph on on one side and on the other you could you could write a message to whoever you were leaving that with um, with your mailing address um, etc we don't have phones yet so you wouldn't have written your phone number down but your your name and and where you could be sent mail to um, here's a whole bunch of cartes here um, there's I mean these are just a selection of what you can find out there in the world um, Like the stereograph camera, the Carte de Visite camera had more than one lens. So with the, the stereo camera, you, you re recall there's two lenses, one on either side. It takes two images at the same time. The Carte camera, well, this version, certain versions of it, could take up to eight different images on one plate, but in succession. So like that first slide here. So here's one that ha had a camera with eight lenses, but they wouldn't take them all at the same time. They would take them individually. So um, you could move around, change your pose. Um, the photographer could change the exposure time to experiment with that. Um, and there's also um, a desire to collect uh, cartes of celebrities and politicians. So not only were folks collecting their friends and family members, but also there's, you know, famous people. Here we have um, Abraham Lincoln. That's one of the, the most popular of the time. And so the Carte became another very heavily marketed photographic trend that was in fashion for about 10 years. And during the time, there were millions of these Cartes made. Um, so yes, here's a here's a Carte camera. This one has 12 lenses on it. This one has four. Um, so you know this, depending on how it was made. So this one here has. Um, you can see there's clips on the lens board. So that means that this one you could have interchanged, um, likely a single lens or a double lens. Um, board on there to sort of diversify the capability of this camera. Um, this one looks like it's built in specifically to have the 12 lenses. So there's a lot of different versions of this type of camera. Okay, so next, art and photography, specifically art reproduction. So it might seem kind of odd today to think that there was a time when you couldn't do a Google image search for any work of art that you wanted to see, or even that there wouldn't be millions of books in the library where you could go to look up the works of art for viewing when you can't make it to the museum that actually houses that work. But before photography, there was no way of seeing works of art unless you went directly to the source or found an engraved reproduction. So photographers started to document works of art in museums in an effort to not only catalog them, but also in the interest of educating the public and for record keeping. So we have this guy named Adolf Braun, and he was one of the very first photographers to catalog artworks for the Louvre in Paris. And he, along with many other photographers, kind of laid this foundation for bringing these works of art to the public through reproductions. And a lot of these works of art were put on the carte de visite, sort of similar to how when you go to a museum today, you can get a postcard of, you know, whatever your favorite artwork was that you saw on your visit. Um, but yeah, so you, so folks would also collect cartes of their favorite artworks as well. Um, some of these artwork reproductions were made into what's called lantern slides for a device called the magic lantern. And the magic lantern was a device for projecting images onto a wall or a screen, first using candles and oil lamps, um, and then later on with electricity, they replaced it with a, with a bulb, of course. Um, but the magic lantern 
allowed art history courses to begin being introduced into universities. And that, of course, creates a higher demand for the lantern slides. So prior to the magic lantern, there was never really art history classes at universities because there wasn't a way to share the artwork in, in a way that could accommodate a, a large audience. So um, here I, I actually have a couple um, videos about magic lanterns. And so I'm going to show, I think I'm going to show two of them and then I'll leave the other one kind of for you to watch on your own. So let me get to the video here. So this one kind of gives the history because the magic lantern actually did exist before photography, but it had to be used with like drawings and, and you know, hand colored on glass as opposed to photographs. So this will give you like the, the broad two minute history version of the magic lantern up till photography. Magic lantern slides brought the world to life in pictures. The first lantern slides were created in the 1600s, around 200 years before photography was invented. They provided spectacular entertainment and education in the way that cinema does today. The first slides were made by painting images onto small pieces of glass. People viewed the painted slides by shining candle or gaslight through them. The invention of electricity and light bulbs could be used instead. Electric light projectors created sharper, brighter, and bigger images, which meant larger audiences could view lantern slideshows together. kind of shows you just a brief history of the magic lantern and how um, it worked when photography came on. Now next I have this um, and this one's kind of funny. So this guy, um, so the, a lot of these old magic lanterns are sold on you know eBay and things like that and this guy is a magic lantern enthusiast and he shows us um, the entire sort of how you use this thing and all the different parts of it. And I think it's pretty interesting. He's also kind of goofy. Um, the, it's a little long, but I think it's good to sort of understand like how this machine works. So um, let's uh, dive into seeing this gentleman show us the uh, magic lantern and how that works. Today, today we're going to demonstrate this pre 1906 Optical Lantern by A.T. Thompson and Company. Now another, another name they call these things is the Magic Lantern. The Magic Lantern. And if you look online, you'll actually find whole groups of people that collect these and are into collecting the slides that go to this. And this is, this is a nice, harmless, and fun little hobby that these people are into. And uh, this this particular magic lantern did not come with any slides, so I wanted to play around a little bit, and we went out and we were on eBay, where else? And we actually picked up and I thought, well, a slide right here. Uh, this is an optical lantern 
slide. It's glass. It's two pieces of glass, actually, uh, sandwiched together. And this is actually by the same company that makes this, the uh, lantern here, the A.T. Thompson Company. As you can see, it says right here, A.T. Thompson Company, Boston, Mass. Good old Boston piece. That's where we're coming from. And uh, it says optical lanterns and slides. And again, there's an address up on the front, also on a plate. So it's stamped. And we looked up the address, and that address when this was manufactured burned down in 1906. So we are sure that this predates that, not only because of that, but because of the style itself and the whole idea of the optical lantern and the way these have progressed. Uh, we can date this to very, very early 1900s, more than likely late 1800s. And if you take a look around as we tour this from the side, this I, I will pull this down and demonstrate it as well. You can just see that it is in excellent shape. Look at that the brass work. The wood just looks terrific. I mean, it shows its age, but that's what you want. The patina on this. Look at this wood. I don't know if this camera is picking up. Just how this green really looks. I will capture it with a snapshot camera for the eBay auction, so look there. The bellows, they're in working condition. Obviously, they're 100 years old, so they're going to be a little bit brittle feeling. But look, they uh, they work fine. I can expand it, shut all the way open and all the way shut. No problems. It's not tearing any further. Uh, the casing itself, it's just awesome the way that that age. Look at that. I mean, just just right. Now, some people, again, there are whole societies of people that collect these. And I are heavily into these collecting slides and, and uh, you know, trying to collect the coolest magic lanterns out there. There's small ones. This is, a, this is a large one. This was used in schools, the garment schools and churches. And uh, so this was used in an auditorium. This can be an auditorium-sized uh, image. Okay. Inside, what you have is you have a bulb, and that is one big bulb. This is my hand. Okay. This is a... It's a big bulb. I have a big hand. Okay. Get some light on that real quick. I I would turn the light itself on because it does work, but you cannot look at that, and neither can this camera. It is that bright. It is hot and bright, and there's a reason it's in a metal box that is well vented. <laughs> one, one neat thing right here is if you look at this right here, that is like a little piece of welder's mask, basically. Basically, and if you Close the door on the outside, you can see. See? And then what happens is when it's lit inside, you can look through that little piece of welder's mask and safely view the filaments of the bulb without burning your retinas. Okay, so what you can do here now, I'll open this up while it's still up here. Okay, I'll pull it down and demonstrate how it actually works. But you can unscrew these little legs. Look at that nice brass down there. You can unscrew these legs, slide this forward. I'll just have to do it with one hand. Uh -huh, it actually wasn't. But now you can see. You can see what I just, I just this whole piece comes out that the uh, last slide goes in. And you can see. Okay. And you can actually lift this up. And I can pull this back as well. And you can get at any of these pieces. See so that? Pull this. Stretch this in there. See this, my lenses. By the way, this this whole piece here can come off, and you can clean your lenses. Both sides. There's a lens here, and there's a lens on this end. Uh, one here, and one here. Two uh, convex lenses. There's a mirror back there. Quite a neat little item here. Really, really love the way this thing looks, the way it works. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and put this back together. No problem, I'm not going to do this with one hand while filming. Fun little thing to play with. Okay, so I've set my unit down and let me show the actual lights in here. Nice. Okay, and uh, as you can see, this is a very well lit room. Okay, so you'll see that even in this well lit, very sunny room, this camera, this uh, magic lantern works. Okay, so what we're going to want to do is grab a self extension cord. Put that right on there. Done. I have a mess in here. I've been eBaying all day with all this stuff. And there it is. It is lit. See that? Right there. Okay. And I don't want to burn anybody's eyeballs, but trust me, just peek it. Oh, you don't even want to look in there, trust me. But it's safe. Oh, there we go. We can see. I told you I 
piece just goes right in there. Nice and easy. Well, I say nice and easy. It's not so easy to find here. Okay. And now I can see that I got it lined up. See? And then I'm going to insert my slide. Now, this particular slide is very fragile. Okay. So I'm going to send it with this magic lantern, but I want you to be very, very careful with it. Okay. Now, what you want to do is take your slide. What I have is a picture of a standard tree. It's again, images. Uh, you can find the images on eBay. Better images than what this video will provide. And uh, what you want to do is put your slide in upside down. Oh, that sounds funny. Okay. And, and, and guess how you do it. to see how these things actually work so that you're not just looking at a picture and like, okay, I should, I should know how this works. So um, there's a third one here. I'm going to let you guys watch that on your own time. This guy has one of the largest collections of lantern slides in the world, and he's really fun. So that'll be on the blackboard for you to watch. Okay. Back to our slideshow. I can get to the right page. Okay, so this you would have seen in one of the videos. This is the um, an engraving uh, showing how the magic lantern works, and you can see there's there's a gentleman on the the right side of the image uh, operating the magic lantern, and there's a gentleman on the stage more towards the left side of the image, um, and you can see the the scene that's being projected up behind him from that lantern, and the huge audience. So how many people are able to come and enjoy seeing these slides together? And then of course here is. Um, someone holding up a lantern slide for you to see there. So next, um, the, the age-old question, is photography art? Now, this is a question that came up at the birth of photography. It has existed ever since then. It still exists today. You will have certain camps of folks who insist that photography is not art. Um, and you can decide which, which camp you want to be in for that. Uh, but the gentleman that I like to use to illustrate this is Charles Baudelaire and Eugene Delacroix. Uh, Baudelaire was um, cool with photography being a means of record keeping, but he thought that photography deadened the imagination, that it wasn't something that um, was a creative enough outlet to be considered art. Similarly, Delacroix insisted that the camera was a machine that could not show 
the complexity of human perception. So both of these guys thought that photography was not art, and like many others, considered it mostly a tool for recording as opposed to it being useful for anything else at all. Uh, so they, they would have had their portraits taken by photographers and they would commission, um, well, Delacroix would commission photographs of models uh, to be taken to assist him with his paintings, aka the academies we talked about last week. Uh, but neither of these gentlemen accepted that photography could surpass painting, nor would it or should it be considered an art form in its own right. And uh, you'll recall that I keep bringing up this um, this topic of the relationship between photography and painting. And so there's folks who feel that painting is threatened by photography, and so they sort of step in to say, oh, photography can never do what painting does. There's no skill involved, et cetera, et cetera. And there's age-old debates that still go on today about the battle between photography and painting. Um, if I were to comment on this, I think that they are two separate things that should not be compared any longer, especially now over 200 years later. Um, but some folks still still do that. So um, if you're interested in that sort of controversy between photography and painting and the question of is photography art, you can sort of ponder that as we go through history of photography this term or you can dig into it a little bit more on Google there's endless articles about that question so to sort of follow up with the is photography art I'd like to talk about Nadar and he was a French caricaturist and political cartoonist who took up photography um, a lot later in life like 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 a lot of the photographers that we'll we'll talk about um, the upper class folks at the time liked to collect images of what they called creative people. So um, artists, um, theater performers, musicians, singers, uh, folks like that, that they would dub the creative people and they liked to collect their portraits. So what Nadar did is he took his sort of talent as a caricaturist and he applied it to creating these really like strongly beautiful heroic portraits of contemporary cultural figures and particularly he worked with artists and writers and at the time he was considered the number one portrait photographer in Paris he was the one that you would go to if you were going to have your portrait made um, and he, he would always maintain that he was not just an operator of the camera, right? That's what a lot of folks would like to think photographers are, is just an operator of a machine and the machine does all the work. Well, that's not true. Um, Nadar maintained that he was an artist and he was very sensitive to all the nuances that come with, you know, taking portraits and navigating personal character and that he also was paying a lot of attention to the rules of composition. And he always would conceptualize his photographs. He wasn't just taking a plain portrait of someone against a black background, which doesn't mean that that's a, a, a negative thing. If you, if you do that, that's, you know, some people want that and that is fine. But in comparison, he was doing something different than that. Um, for example, here we have a portrait of Nadar in his hot air balloon basket. And at first glance, we may think that this image was taken of him floating high above Paris in his balloon. But if we look at this image, you can see that he staged these images in his photographic studio, which is, you know, you could say that that's deceptive, but it's also like just a creative way to, you know, get people into your studio. You know, if you advertise like this photo and say, oh, you can get your photo in the basket too. You can get people coming in just like this couple to have their portrait made in the balloon basket. Now, Nadar actually did own a, a real hot air balloon and he took the very first aerial photographs from his balloon. And later on, he would actually deliver the mail with his balloon when Paris was under siege during the war. 
So um, Nadar, with these types of photographs, was doing a lot more than just documenting and cataloging. He was creating and staging scenes. So he was being very creative. There's also this really funny work um, <laughs> that I really like. He used something similar to the Carte de Visite camera to capture these 12 images of himself. And he's, in, he's spinning in a chair and he calls it a revolving self-portrait. And um, this next slide, it's supposed to be a GIF, but I think the Blackboard Collaborate is accessing that on my thing here. So I Googled it so that I could show it to you because someone turned that um, 12 picture uh, portrait of, of Nadar into a GIF. And I just, I think it's so funny. So let me grab it here. There you go. <laughs> Uh, I think when I first discovered this years ago, I stared at this for like a good 20 minutes because I just think it's so goofy. And you can imagine that this is probably what Nadar was thinking you would think about when you looked at that um, 12 image portrait of him in the chair. So, um, so that's that. Let me get us back to our slideshow here always have to scroll all the way back to our spot that we were at here. Nadar, there you are. Okay. So, so that's, that's Nadar there. Um, next, I want to dig a little deeper into high art photography. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, Hughes considered high art photography to be something that would make you think about a, think at a higher level. It was something that was to educate you or to tell a story, um, whether that is myth, mythology, religion, literature, um, etc. So to bring bring everything to a higher level. And you'll see on the the slide here the, this word tableau vivants, and that means living pictures. And these those were very popular subjects for early photographers working in this way. Um, before photography, tableau vivants was something that um, existed, but it just wasn't documented. So you'd have these performing troops, these these theater actors. Um, they would act out a scene, and then they would they would hold it still. So it was a live act that you could walk up to and, and look around and see what was going on. But it was you know real live people, and uh, they would hold very still for a long time so that you could see what they were doing. Um, so some examples of high art photography. We have this um, image by William Lake Price. And Price was originally a painter who adopted photography and started making portraits of famous people, scenes from everyday life, still life studies, and tableau vivants from literature. And this image here is Price's recreation of a character, Don Quixote, from the novel by Cervantes. And we can see Price is influenced by the tradition of inspirational or uplifting painting. This image here um, is full of things that you would see represented in an historical painting. And you could imagine this, this sort of rivaling some of those historical paintings as well. Uh, the most famous high art photograph, we, we looked at this earlier, was made by Oscar Raylander, also began as a painter. So you can see between, you know, William Lake Price and Oscar Raylander, both of them started off as painters and then moved into this high art photography. So you can see their painterly influence is brought in to kind of inspire what they're doing in these images here. So uh, again, we can see that outside of even just uh, Price and, and Raylander, there's a lot of other painters who are using those painterly sensibilities to inform and, and conceptualize these photographic images. And this particular image here was influenced by Raphael's fresco called the School of Athens. And Raylander has called it the two ways of life. And there's, there's a pretty okay description, I think, of this in your book. But essentially, you've got, you know, this wise man in the center. And then to um, to your right, there's the, the good 
um, righteous young man uh, who is moving towards, you know, religion and hard work and intellectual study and caring for the sick, um, you know, all of the things that would fall on like, oh, you're a good person kind of side of life. On the other side, you have this gentleman who, or young man rather, who is being tempted by, um, you know, gambling and drinking and, and sex and drugs and all of these other things. So um, this is in sort of a, a moral of the story, kind of you have two choices in, in life. I mean, obviously it's more complicated than that, but... Um, when when you're trying to represent something in in a painting or a high art photograph rather um it's it gets a little didactic so um that's what's happening in this particular image here uh the women in this image were from a theatrical troupe that were, would perform tableau vivants live for the public and everything that the that the actresses in this um scene did were derived from classical paintings and sculptures and things like that. Now, this particular print was really large for its time. It was about 31 inches wide. It was made from more than 30 individual negatives. So combination printing being used again. This is what we talked about last week with Edward Baldus and Gustave Gray. Um, and so most images, like I think I mentioned this, you probably wouldn't get a photograph much larger than than eight by ten from a single negative, just because there were a lot of limitations back then with the sizes of things, because the everything wasn't as in, industrialized as it is today. Um, so you know, we go into museums now, and you'll see photographs that are the size of a wall, and they sort of rival the size of some of those very old historical paintings. Um, photo photographs in their early stages wouldn't be able to get that large on their own. Um, so 31 inches was, was pretty huge and epic for a photograph at that time. Um, in defense of the, the high art photograph, because you still have folks who are saying that photography is not art and shouldn't be used for, for art, because why bother when you have painting? Um, so in defense of high art photography, Raylander and, and others would argue that because there's so much labor involved, um, combined with how he's using uh, inspiration from a Renaissance source and the sort of uplifting theme, the morals embedded in here, that what's happening in, in his high art photography and other high art photography distances it from what he called ordinary photography and puts it on the same level as painting. So you would have painting enthusiasts who would disagree with that, but um, I, I would agree that they're on the same level. And I still like to emphasize that, you know, I think painting and, and photography should be thought of as separate from each other. Um, but we still have this this argument <laughs> coming up on and on about painting versus photography and and which one is is the right one. But anyways, that sort of sums up our high art photography conversation there. Next, I want to talk about um, women behind the camera. And your book does this weird thing where it divides this women section into amateurs and professionals, and I think that's really stupid because they don't do it for any of the the men amateurs versus professionals. Um, so I have it on the slides just so that you can kind of like reference back to where I'm talking about these, but I disagree with having to um, split these particular women into categories of amateurs versus professionals, because I think also at this time there wouldn't have been such a thing as necessarily a professional photographer because everyone was still figuring out what to do with it. So I, I would say if we had to classify, I would put everyone in the amateur category, but um, that's just me. Anyways, um, in the 19th century, it was on very rare occasion that women would be allowed to learn photography and travel. And we have, first off, Harriet um, Titler. Uh, she was married to a British officer in India, which allowed her the rare opportunity to learn photography, travel extensively, and produce a body of work on her own, as well as in collaboration with her husband. 
So um, while he was doing his military stuff, she would be doing making photographs and um, likely teaching other folks how to do photography as well. Um, but she also did collaborations with him. So Harriet and her husband made about 300 photographs throughout their travels in India. And here's one of hers that she made. You can see she did a lot of these landscape, um, cityscapes images over in India. Um, there were also a few privileged women, such as Lady Augusta Mostyn and her sister, Caroline, Caroline Neville. And I had this question come up. Um, so Lady Caroline Neville and Lady Augusta Mostyn, I had this question come up, and no one had ever asked it for and, and before. And they said, why are bo both of their first names Lady? And um, it's, it's not. Lady is a title like um, Mrs. or, or Ms. Uh, a formal title like the lady and lord of the manor kind of a thing it's very old school and you don't hear it much anymore but um since that question came up i was like oh i should explain that because that does look kind of confusing anyways um we have lady augusta and her sister lady carolyn they were very well off they had a lot of money um they were photographic enthusiasts and participated in something that was called the photographic exchange club in britain and Lady Augusta Mostyn established the Mostyn Art Gallery, um, creating the very first gallery specifically to show women's work. And it still exists today. So let me get that link up here for you so you can see, just get a brief peek into that. Is it working? Yeah, OK. So we still have the Mostyn Gallery still exists um, in Wales and you can kind of explore all the different things about it if you want to dig into current future past um, exhibitions and see all about the first gallery specifically for women. Women's work which was awesome. So um, because the work of, of women was not often shown um, it's not widely known um, and, and a lot of, you know, I, I've said this earlier that, um, sorry, I'm trying to get back to our slide and also talk at the same time. All right, here we go. So a lot of women's work isn't cataloged. It's not kept in, you know, the same way that the men's work was kept in records and archives for us to study. A lot of the, the work made by women was kept in private collections in private homes and wasn't really recognized. And so, you know, it's taken 200 years and now, you know, you have historians that are uh, trying to locate and find all of this historic work by women photographers, women artists, so that we can get a more accurate um, representation of history that's not so sort of like white man heavy and we can get more more information on the broader spectrum of, of who's working at, at what time in history and what they're making and how that you know affected the development of photography as well so um, that all said to tidy up this conversation about the Mostyn sisters um, it, it you can tell that they have a lot of money because the most popular portraits of them are these two, these paintings, right? So both of them have these large formal paintings made of them. So they have a lot of money because they're still paying someone to do this for them, even though they could just have their picture taken. Um, and I think this is the photograph uh, from your textbook that is one of Lady Augusta Mostyn's personal photographs that she would take herself. The next woman I want to talk about is Lady Filmer. Um, she's one of my favorites. She is a slightly elusive Victorian photographer. Um, she would make these portraits and kind of cut them up and arrange them on sheets of paper where she would then watercolor in the backgrounds. And she, it's she's wonderful because she's a really great example of early collage work and. I think a lot of textbooks, including the one that we're using for this class, um, as well as a lot of web sources, will say that the Cubists and um, 
basically men invented collage work, but that's completely false. Collage began in the 19th century with women, Victorian women in their homes. And a lot of them would do it as a hobby. They would cut up and make little um, cards or artworks and things to share with their friends. A lady filmer kind of took it to another level where she was actually making these large, larger artworks. Um, so it's just, it's really important to remember that men didn't invent collage. It was never invented by a man. And any, if you ever read that, like just ignore it because it is false history and it was women that invented um, and started using collage as an art form. Um, men just sort of like to take credit for it. So um, this is one of one of her images here. She also like get well her and other women working in the same way they like to get like subtly political and, and social commentary through these things. So if you look closely at her images there's always a very specific reason for the layout and placement of everything in these images. So on the wall in the back, you can see that the, the large portraits hanging are, are of women. The women are sort of dominant in this image, in this space, um, not just because women are, are part of the home and, and dominant in the home at that time, but uh, because she's sort of trying to show like how significant they are in comparison to men. Um, here, this is one of my favorite ones, is it's an umbrella and you've got all these portraits of men on the top and then you have this crooked handle and typically if we were in the classroom I'd ask you to sort of tell me what you think this means but I'll give you sort of a, a general idea and then mull it over a little bit. This, this could be, you know, something to really think about but there's a portrait of a woman on the handle and she's holding up all of these men on top of this umbrella. And I just think that's so powerful and such a strong statement. And you know, she, these, these images probably would have never been shown to men at all. But you know, this is still a subtle way to show that like the woman is, is sort of supporting this patriarchal system. And um, there's, there's a lot of things we could say about this, but I'll leave it at that for now. Very similarly, in this one, you have a man in the middle and you have all of the women surrounding him. And she's also brought in the, the, the floral element here to sort of emphasize that femininity. So um, Lady Filmar is awesome. I highly recommend digging into her work a little bit more if you have time. Next we have Clementina Hogwarden, and she um, made some really fun work for the Victorian era as well. Uh, her collection that she made was over 800 images during the time she was photographing, which is kind of insane to think about, um, especially with all the work that has to go into, um, if you're not making, if you're not using pre-made paper, if you're making your own, um, Producing all these images in a dark room by hand is it's so much time and labor so much more than you know using um, a computer to do it these days so um, Like a lot of photographers at this time she did some landscapes But her most interesting photos are those of daughters that she made in her home um, She had a townhouse in London and so they took the entire top floor and dedicated it to her photographic studio. So she had a whole space with lots of beautiful light um, and she could just kind of play and make these beautiful images. So she would compose scenes that um, always seem like they're part of a story, right? You might not know what that story is, but they definitely make you think, okay, like what's happening in this image and why is she dressed that way and what are they thinking and you know, why is the one girl on the outside of the window and the other on the inside of the window? You know, it sort of, it provokes you to think about the symbolism that's happening within these, these images here. So she would dress up her daughters and some of the other uh, young women would, would come in costumes and, and to make her, her photographs more story-like. A lot of times she would use um, a mirror 
in her scenes. And I like to call this out because the mirror is a really important symbol throughout history. Um, but it's it's also important to, to see how it's used in this particular time period, the Victorian time period. So uh, not only do mirrors add depth to a scene, it kind of opens it up the same way it does if you put a mirror in a room, right? It makes it seem bigger. Um, but the mirror is also a Victorian symbol for the tension between reality and appearance and the line between art and life. So um, really important to understand that when mirrors are put into photographs and art in general, um, they're, they're there for a reason and a purpose and to deepen the, the message that's being shared. Uh, here's the section from your book that's labeled professionals. You know how I feel about these categories, so I won't belabor that point, but um, there were very few women that had the resources to set up uh, full-time commercial photographic studios, um, but they were definitely present in all phases of the photographic production. So we have um, Marie Letty Cabanas Bonfels, what a, what a mouthful that name is. Um, so she did uh, very similar to um, some of the other photographers. She worked with her husband. Uh, they, they did studio photography. They worked out of Beirut. Um, and she did both portrait and landscape photography. And I have two portraits that she made that I think are really, um, really lovely. So here's, here's one of them. And Here's the other. We'll come back to talking more about her work later. I just want to lightly touch on, on the portraits from her studio that um, she was she was working on then. Um, but she's she's an interesting character. So we'll she'll she'll resurface at some point. I don't know if it's this week or next week, but she'll she'll return and we'll talk more about some of her work that wasn't just these these types of portraits either. Okay. So then we have Julia Margaret Cameron, and she is probably one of the most famous female photographers from the Victorian era. Uh, like a lot of the, the men we've talked about, she took up photography much later in life when she was gifted a camera. And according to Hughes' three categories of photography that we were talking about earlier, we would consider Cameron to be working in the realm of high art photography. So this is a self-portrait that she took here. So that, that's her. And she took portraits of a lot of her friends and friends of friends, as well as of Victorian cultural figures like Charles Darwin, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Here, you should recognize this. This is, this is John Herschel here. She was um, very good friends with him. And um, he... In case you don't remember, he's the one who, who um, did the cyanotypes. He, he invented those, the blue photographs. And you can see here that she has a very distinctive approach to portraiture. And so she, she specifically did not fix his hair or his appearance or anything. She wanted to render his sort of very active mind on, on the physical aspect of his persona. So um, she, she has this quote about this particular image here, and she says that my whole soul has endeavored to do its duty toward them in recording faithfully the greatness of the inner as well as the features of outer man. So here she's, um, she's uh, trying to show his inside of his mind and his soul and through his outward appearance and through the way that she is photographing him. So in her work, she uses friends, family, some of her servants. She transforms them into characters from the Bible, Greek mythology, Renaissance paintings, as well as important figures in British lore and literature. Now, because women generally didn't have the identity and authority in the cultural and intellectual world like the men did, they were much more easily transformed into literary characters. What I mean by this is she mostly used women because women didn't go out in public as much as men did. So if she used a lot of her more 
prominent male friends, you might look at the image and get kind of distracted by, oh, that's John Herschel playing this character, as opposed to allowing yourself to kind of just get lost in the scene, get lost in the story. Um, Cameron tries to explain that the slightly blurred focus that becomes kind of her characteristic style resulted from her early attempts at photography when she was using a lens that had such a short focal length that only a small region of the sitter's face would be sharp. But the this style really suits her subject matter. Um, if there was a detailed, a incredibly detailed, like daguerreotype level detailed photograph of any one of her characters, it would, again, like I said about the men, it would look too much like someone acting out the role. But the cloudy version appears as if it's some sort of imagined version or something that you remember, like a dream. And that kind of allows you to get lost in, in thinking about the, the story that she's referencing in her photograph. Um, so let's uh, watch a, a brief video about Julia's work here. Let me get to our video player. Okay. All right. Julie Margaret Cameron was one of the most important and innovative photographers of the 19th century. She was born in 1815, uh, but she didn't take up photography until the 1860s. In 1863, she was 48 years old and she was given a camera as a present. She was an amazingly energetic woman and she just threw herself into photography. She was a pioneering portrait photographer. She worked exclusively in portraiture and she photographed many of the leading intellectuals and artists of her own time. She also made staged photographs of tableaus based on stories from literature or history and also made numerous religious subjects as well. Her sitters were drawn from her intellectual and artistic circle and as well as her own household staff. She photographed her own domestic servants uh, repeatedly and she was also a wonderful photographer of children. In 1865, the South Kensington Museum acquired from Julia Margaret Cameron 114 photographs. These photographs are still in the museum's collection, and today the VNA has over 250 photographs by Julia Margaret Cameron. Our Cameron holdings are, are really some of the treasures of our collection. And by studying these original photographs, we can learn so much more about her process, about her intentions, about what she was trying to do with these photographs, how she wanted them presented, and how they might have been understood at the time that she was making them. Not only did Julia Margaret Cameron exhibit her photographs at the South Kensington Museum in 1865, the same year that the museum collected her work. In 1868, she used two rooms at the museum as a studio, perhaps qualifying her as its first artist in residence. This is Henry Cole's diary from 1868. Henry Cole was the founding director of the South Kensington Museum, which is now the Victoria and Albert Museum. Just as for Cameron herself, her professional activities were very much intertwined with her social life. And on um, the 14th of March, 1868, Henry Cole records in his diary, after lunch with Mrs. Cameron, who took six negative portraits of me. So this gives us some indication of how many tries it might have taken to get a successful portrait. Julia Margaret Cameron is my great, great, great grandmother. Um, and I'm descended from her son, Eugene. So I'm the third generation grandchildren, and I'm also Julia Margaret Cameron. 
There was definitely a presence in the household. I mean, there was a lot of her books uh, around, and we did have a few prints, and when we'd go and visit family, they'd often talk about her. But actually, when I started being interested in photography, when I was a bit older, I would start coming to the V&A and finding out more about her. And the more you find out, the more you want to know. And then I was kind of looking to find out about her and her character, and her as a woman as well as a photographer. So this is the first time I've actually seen her letters in physical form, which is just incredible, just really inspired. and. She, you know, it's amazing that she's got this really powerful energy that comes through her letters, so it's amazing to actually be able to see them in person. 20th of May, 1865. My dear Mr. Cole, I have real pleasure in telling you that Mr. Watts thinks my photograph of you extremely fine. 21st of February, 1866. My dear Mr. Cole, I write to you if you'll be having any photographic soiree or meeting soon, which I have so perpetually remembered for your helping kindness and ever friendly hand to me in the earlier years of my art, that I delight in now sending you my last portrait of Alfred Tennyson, which I think you would agree with me in feeling is a national treasure of immense value. I will come out and work with renewed energy at your museum, so that I am eager for an answer, and I know that your kindness needs no fanning interaction. Yours very truly, with my love to your wife and to Alan. And to yours ever, Julia Margaret Cameron. She was using the wet collodion process, and this was a very cumbersome process. Um, the photographs were made onto um, glass plates. These are large glass plates. All of her prints are contact prints. So whenever you see a Judy Margaret Cameron print, you know that the negative had to be at least as large as the image that you're looking at. So these are large glass plates. They're fragile and they have to be coated with a number of different substances at different stages in their processing. There are a lot of opportunities to make mistakes. And Cameron um, was a very um, exuberant, um, uh, character and um, and you feel her energy when you look at her photographs. She was so excited about this new way um, that she was making art, that she was expressing herself um, artistically. In Cameron's photographs, there are all sorts of um, things that other photographers would have dismissed as flaws, but what she seemed to embrace. So for example, there are smudges, there are even her own fingerprints sometimes um, on the photograph, embedded into the photographic negative. There are smears, there are swirls. And today, I think those imperfections are very attractive to contemporary audiences because we can see that these are handmade objects. Um, these aren't the cold, precise results of a machine. And we really get a sense of an individual artist who produced these works of art. All right. So let me get back to her work is, is really lovely and, and very beautiful. Um, she was, you know, there's there's a lot of women photographers and a lot of their work like exists. We just have to kind of find it. Um, but unlike a lot of these photographers, uh, Julia Margaret Cameron was able to publicly display her photographs and she did attempt to sell them. Um, now, obviously she had a little bit more access than a lot a lot of women because of her sort of status and wealth and friendships with you know folks like John Herschel and and Alfred Tennyson and folks like that so again this is this this sort of knowledge of her work is perpetuated by her access to more people and and more tools and and a greater uh, ability to disseminate what she was doing throughout history and have a, a solid record of it, whereas some other women photographers might not have had the same access and therefore we don't have access to um, as much of their work and knowledge about their work as we would like to. So. Um, that said, this week's lecture does get long because we're covering two chapters, so I'm going to stop this video and um, you guys should take a little bit of a break and then come back and watch the second one, um, which we'll, we'll start into that. It just it gets a little long if you don't take a break. So if you're feeling great and you want to keep watching and um, 
you know, start up the, the second half of this one, um, feel free to, but um, I, I want to give you all a little bit of a break here. So let's, let's pause and, and return in a, in a moment, all right? <laughs> 